Welcome to this rebroadcast of an interview with Chris Shea, founder of Life's Journey Life Coaching. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. everyone. Today I'm joined by Chris Shea. Chris is um, a therapist, coach, campus minister, published author, and a podcaster who has a wonderful podcast called On Finding Peace, which for those of you who listen um, to me often know that is a big goal of mine in life. So today I'm thrilled to be talking with Chris and sharing him with all of you. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. It's great to be here. I appreciate you having me on the show. Now you're talking to us from Leonardtown, Maryland. Is that correct? That is correct. It's a small uh, rural town uh, down in Southern Maryland. Ah, what is the biggest city that it's close to? Uh, we are south of both Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, about an hour and a half to two hour drive from either of those. Oh, okay. Super. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, as you may or may not know, on the show, I talk about how people found their purpose and how they live the life that they do. Um, so with you, it's so intriguing to me because the name of your website is exactly what I want to talk about. The website that Chris has is lifesjourney.com. Chris, what was your life journey to the point that you are now in your career? What brought you here? It's a long, winding journey. Uh, in hindsight, all good. Yeah. Um, but the somewhat short of it, I, uh, spent most of my career up in the Baltimore area and I was involved in doing counseling work, uh, plus administration work. I, uh, was, uh, honored to run inpatient medical treatment facilities. Uh, we specialized in drug and alcohol treatment, uh, but we were inpatient medical and, uh, I really enjoyed being an administrator uh, because the way I looked at that is I was able to help a lot of people, um, even though I didn't have always a caseload, uh, it was still very uh, rewarding for me. Uh, there were always nonprofits, so that was uh, something that was important to me, you know, giving back to the community. But I'm a type A person. I love to always be busy. Um, I'm still very busy. But back then, the busyness began to take over my life. And in the busyness, uh, everything else seemed to go off to the wayside. So work and career, uh, titles, prestige, all of that became more important. Uh, so as my career took off, I got into speaking at uh, national conferences and started writing and getting published in journals. And I found myself pretty high up in my field uh, as far as being known and in what I was doing. And as rewarding as that is, um, it brings a lot of stress and anxiety if you're all not keeping a balanced life and care of yourself, neither of which I was doing. So for me, the big change came is when I, I started to realize, you know, I needed to slow things up a bit. Um, and an opportunity came uh, here down in Leonardtown. And I thought maybe this is a good time in my life to uh, start different, you know, to get away from the city, get away from all of that and just do something totally different. And that's when I picked up the campus ministry job. 
which was awesome um, and love every minute of that. The issue for me came in when uh, I do this at a high school, when the academic year ended and I now have months off. For me, that was, you know, the thought of that was like, hey, this is awesome. I got three months paid vacation, basically, way to go. I've never had three months off before, um, except for the times that I was laid off. <laughs> then I was off, but that was different. After getting close to about week two of being off, that's when it hit me. And things started kind of going downhill for me at that point. Uh, because the type A in me, the person who has been going from corporate world and all the stressors that that had and all the pressures that were on me, that was gone. There was nothing. And I kind of hit that brick wall of this nothingness of, of what do I do? I kind of was almost in, in a depression type mm -hmm. stage and I, it, it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. um, I needed something to do. And I spent a good number of weeks uh, through this struggle in eventually finding mindfulness and finding meditation again in beginning to consciously slow myself into looking more at who I am. And as I did that, I decided to uh, do some journaling. But instead of doing journaling in some diary or folder, I decided to do a blog. Why not? I'm on the computer all the time. And that's really where Life's Journey came about, was a blog uh, more so as a public diary, more as a journal. Really, it was just for me to have uh, some outlet. And from there, uh, that was probably, what, six-ish or so years ago. And from there, we now have what I'm doing. Uh, now it's a private practice. I've authored some books, uh, doing speakings. I now have podcasts. Um, so it's grown mm -hmm. into what it is today, and it keeps me extremely busy. But the difference is... I'm busy intentionally. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I'm only doing what it is that I feel I'm able to do. And I'm trying to do it in a way that's still healthy for me. I'm still trying to practice those daily routines of the meditation and taking care of self and looking at self. Very different than what I was doing before. Mm -hmm. So long and short of it, here I am. Thank you very much for sharing all of that. There's lots of pieces in there I'd love to explore a little more. One, Definitely. I thank you. One, I think it's really important that people hear that the path isn't always smooth. It's not straight and it does have pitfalls. Yes, it does. Yeah, definitely it, it's, you know, if somebody thinks that, you know, I can go from point A to point B in a straight line, you are going to end up with having stress and anxiety when you find out that that straight line is going to become very curved. But that's okay. You know, in, in hindsight, those curves are really what got me to here. And had this been more of a straight line for me, uh, we probably wouldn't be talking. I probably wouldn't be in this town. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad for the curves. Yeah. And from your perspective, as both someone who experienced it and as a professional, you know, as a therapist, you have both sides of it. So you really speak from a powerful position, which I think has tremendous um, impact and value in sharing as well. Um, the, there's so many things I'm now trying to remember. From the outside, as you were talking, I was thinking to some people, it might not look that different. You were speaking before, you were at the top of your career before when you were in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So if somebody missed all those middle years and saw you online and saw you had maybe a different name to a website instead of working for a firm 
or, oh, Chris started a podcast, they might think nothing was really different. You've just grown. So all those metal pieces are really right. instructional. Yeah. It's interesting that so much happens from within. Right. How did you know? Exactly. Yeah. From the exterior, if I listed, you know, what my day is like, it's going to seem to somebody, well, you're overwhelming yourself. And isn't that what you were doing? Uh, but yeah, it is what works on the inside. It is that intentionality. And to me, the part of that mindfulness, it, you know, before it was just do, 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 regardless of what that's, what the impact is for me. Uh, so now it's, yes, I'm going to be doing a lot, but I'm still trying to be aware of what is the impact to me and family uh, when I'm doing all of this. So it, it's not the haphazard, let me just do everything. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and I would say right now in this field, I'm, I'm just one of the fish. I, I'm not a, a top notch uh, person in the field. You know, there, there's bigger names you would think of if you think mindfulness uh, than my name. So that keeps me humble. Well, everything in life is relative. You know, we can always look to people that are bigger and smaller, no matter where we are, correct? Exactly, exactly. You, you hopefully touch the people that you're meant to touch. Yeah, yeah. Um, did moving from a city like Baltimore to a small town affect your lifestyle and your path at all? It helped to slow me down. Uh, the pace is very different. Uh, the pace is much uh, calmer. Um, so I think that overall that helped uh, in that, but, um, but it wasn't a, a huge shift. My, uh, most of my college life was living in rural towns. Uh, so it wasn't a complete unknown to me. But mm -hmm. yes, I, I think overall it did have a, a part to play in, in where I am now. Um, the rituals and the, I'm not sure if you called them rituals, but the routines that you follow of mindfulness and meditation and such are also what you talk about on your podcast on Finding Peace, correct? Correct. Yes. Did you, it, was that the intention behind the podcast? Yes, and, and the podcast has morphed uh, over time as well. Uh, originally, the podcast was to broaden the audience, uh, my reach. You know, so what I was doing in the early days of the podcast, which still exists if people look at those, uh, they really consisted of taking my blog posts and putting them to audio. It's okay. really the simplest way to put it. And you know, I figure this way, if you don't have time to read it, well, maybe you have time to listen to it. But as I thought about it, uh, to me, I thought what would be more important, because it was important to my uh, life story, what have other people done in their lives that we can learn from? So what I focus the podcast uh, mostly on is interviewing people who have found ways of either getting toward peace or obtaining peace. And I asked them to share with us, what are some very practical ways that we can do that? So it's not a, a theoretical, you know, type of, of podcast, but very practically, you know, you went from this to this. So if I'm listening to the podcast, what can I do to go from that to that? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I figure that's how I learned maybe others can learn as well. And you do occasional episodes with yourself presenting, correct? Correct, there are still the occasional where I'm just gonna talk. Uh, that is now, I'm not reading my blog posts anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's just me, you know, having something that hopefully is of value uh, to the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because your process and journey like we're talking about is a value for people to take actionable steps as well.
through meditation, mindfulness, and what you've taken into your life. Um, I'm curious what you were like as a little boy. <laughs> oh, wonderful days that they were. Um, <laughs> I, I think I, I'm, I'm at that age now where I can look back and say, those were the simpler times. Uh, uh. <laughs> um, but uh, actually, it, it probably would be quite surprising because growing up, I was the shy kid. I was the one who stayed in the corner. I had a uh, small group of friends, a uh, tight group of friends, but small. And really when it comes to being outgoing, uh, when it comes to doing a lot uh, after school or things like that, that wasn't me. I, I would go home, do my homework, grab uh, you know, some of my friends and off we would go. But I was extremely shy. I, you know, if you were to tell younger self that one day you're going to be speaking on national stages and doing podcasts and things like this, yeah, that would have been foreign to me. That would have been, you know, there is no way that's going to happen. I'm not speaking in front of people. Uh, so, yes, uh, younger me was very different me. What was the changing point? The turning point. Self-confidence What was the change for me. Uh, the shyness had a lot to do with self-esteem. Okay. And as I aged uh, through my 20s and started actually being in a career, mm -hmm. then a lot of that changed. And, and I, I slowly, and I emphasized slowly, uh, began to have more of self-confidence, not only in me as a person, but the self-confidence in me as a professional. So when that shifted, uh, I became more outgoing. So the, this was probably always in me. I just <laughs> wasn't aware it was in me. Yeah. It's interesting that um, from what you're saying, I'm observing the external, the job in your 20s was bringing out the internal. And as you were describing your uh, coming to peacefulness in later life, you once again went internally to find that peace. So, you know, it juxtaposed, but nonetheless, I find the contrast interesting between right. the exterior and the interior. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate that reflection. It's uh, I hadn't really looked at it in those terms before, but yeah, it really, uh, really makes a lot of sense as I move into uh, another phase of my life age wise. It, uh, it, it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate that. Um, you're also a campus minister and I am not, um, real schooled in what it requires to be a campus minister. Are you a priest as well? Is that part of the requirement to be a campus minister? Not part of the requirement. Uh, I'm not ordained. Um, I actually did spend time in Catholic seminary. Uh, one of my ideas was to get ordained one day, uh, that life path was one of the curves. Uh, so that didn't happen, but, um, I do have degrees in theology and what my responsibilities are with the high school is the overall spiritual care of the students and staff. Uh, it is a Catholic school and, uh, you know, part of what we do there is try to enrich the spiritual life, whether you're Catholic or not. Um, so a lot of that, you know, what I'm doing is similar with the mindfulness, just with the spiritual aspect uh, attached to that. So it is about how do we self-reflect, how do we meditate, uh, you know, how do we stay in the moment with the goal of this will enrich your spiritual life, get you closer uh, to God. So what are the things that we need to do to do that? In a lot of ways, I see the similarities to what I do in this work plus the high school. Um, it's just, what am I emphasizing more of in one place uh, versus the other? 
by this work, what, what are you referring to? The similarities in this work, you said. Do you mean in the, the therapy? Uh, Right, the campus yeah. ministry, the life coaching and therapy, yeah. uh, very similar, just, you know, the one is the big push for the spiritual uh, in the life coaching counseling, um, you know, being uh, aware and respectful of the client, it's however they want to go with the spiritual, I'm good with that, um, but a lot of the techniques is really the same. Yeah. The reason I wanted to clarify that is we were talking about the podcast and the writing also. So I wanted to make sure you were focused on the therapy and the coaching at that point. Um, yes. How do you define, define mindfulness? I'm going into these specific questions, but let's back up a minute. How do you define it? There are a lot of definitions out there. Um, Really, for me, it's mindfulness is living in the present moment non judgmentally. And, you know, John Cabot Zinn, he emphasizes the non judgmentally. That's where I'm pulling that piece from. Uh, but it is all about living in the moment. And what I mean with the non judgmentally is just to accept what your reality is. Now that doesn't mean I can't work on changing my reality if that's something that you know I, I feel is necessary. But before I can look at a possible change in my reality, I just need to come to terms with and accept what that reality is. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to lie to ourselves, trick ourselves, fool ourselves as to what we would like our reality to be and then live accordingly, that's gonna bring out a lot of stress and anxiety. If we can sit back and just accept where we are, the good, the bad, and the otherwise, then look at what do I need to do different to improve my life. So we need to start in that basis of reality. And with my therapy, that's where I start with the clients as well. You know, let's, let's just start with reality, even if you don't like that reality or like to admit that reality. No, it is what it is, accept it, now what? Yeah, um, and I see how those elements can all pull in together. Um, you know, the mindfulness is the calming aspect because it's in the present moment. The non-judgment is exactly. the potential. And then the choice point of what do I want to do about this? Um, so I see exactly where you're right. going with all that. Do you find that just the way things turn out, people uh, orient to you for your work that are more spiritually oriented? Not necessarily. Uh, when I first started, I had made the assumption in my own mind that that's what would happen. Mm -hmm. But I think we also have to look at what we mean by spiritual. Mm -hmm. You know, in my campus ministry work that's very well defined um, mm -hmm. in my personal life that's very well defined for me but in life in general for me the the spiritual is anything greater than who I am so in that sense I think many of the people who seek me are trying to find something bigger than them that, that they realize that that's what's missing in life, that it, it's, you know, not a, not what, you know, life isn't giving us what we had hoped it would because we're just relying on what we see, what we can touch and have and possess. But I think there's just this human nature in us to look toward and try to seek something that's bigger than us. Uh, and to me, that that's bigger than religion. That that's you know, I'm not talking a religious focus, mm -hmm. uh, but something that is greater than us. You know, and then for me in my personal life, I'll translate that to my religion in my campus mm -hmm. ministry. We translate that, but uh, I think in general, that's really what people are looking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and thank you for the definition. That's really helpful and important. 
the curved parts of your path, you mentioned one was not going through with the um, priesthood. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like all the curves contributed in some way and informed where you are now? Almost definitely. Okay. Um, when I look in hindsight, I wouldn't be who I am today without those experiences. Okay. Uh, for me, it's very important, and I try to help my clients with this as well, but very important to understand that we are who we are because of our past. Mm -hmm. Again, good, bad, or otherwise, you know, you could talk about a very bad childhood or a bad past or, or you know, whatever. Again, that's the acceptance piece, you know, that is what it is, but that's also who, what has made you. And if at this point in your life, you have a great deal of resilience, then yes, I feel, you know, sympathy for you that you had to go through what you did, but you have built in resilience, which is wonderful to have at this point. Um, yeah, particularly my time in seminary really gave me a lot of the tools to be able to be where I am today. So I think minus that, I probably wouldn't have found the mindfulness piece. I wouldn't have found that spiritual piece. Um, I think I would have been strictly academic psychology with it versus what I see as more human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that I kind of makes sense. I, the, the words fail at the moment, but but I, I really see where, where that has, that experience was very important to me. So that's not something where I look back on and say, I wasted time. I actually look back at, at those years and, and say, this is really that foundational piece. Mm -hmm. um, and then my different jobs, my different positions in those jobs, those experiences, they, they all shape where I am. But I think that probably had one of the bigger uh, you know, profound natures that led me to where I am today when I needed a foundation when I was going through that kind of crisis of, of self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think of it as you're talking in terms of a depth and a richness and in enhancement, you know, instead mm -hmm. of just intellectual um, rote knowledge almost. So right. I understand what you're saying in that sense, um, something is occurring to me that it's not an exact analogy, but I can't help but put these two thoughts together. The writer and thinker, Jack Kornfield, who writes a lot on Buddhism, yes. um, I heard him speak once about some concept in Buddhism, and he was saying, people always expect me to be really calm and really laid back and really peaceful. And he said, if you didn't know who I was and you saw me on the street, you would think I was the most hyper guy. I'm a really high energy person. And I think that is, I, I really enjoyed that because what mm -hmm. I observe in general about some of these concepts like mindfulness and meditation and such is I believe there's a, uh, bias in terms of the vision that they're all peaceful mm -hmm. and calm and yet to me there's a joy and there's a, mm -hmm. a lightness to them you know there's an energy around them a silliness at exactly. times even um, mm -hmm. what what are your thoughts around that I, I completely agree because as I had mentioned earlier I'm all about trying to stay within reality and I don't care how much you're going to practice Buddhism, Zen, any type of Christian meditations. I don't care what it is that you do. Unless you have removed yourself and have become a monk. Other than that, you're living in this world. And this world is not going to stop because you are meditating or because you know some of these concepts. And if you try to be in this world, but live like that monk, people are gonna look at you as crazy and you're probably not gonna get anybody. You know, I mean, most of us recognize a monk, but not the monk in society. 
all that needs to be tempered with, you know, be real and be true to who you are. And these principles, all of these principles, whether it's Eastern, Western, makes no difference. They're leading us down a path of finding peace. But as far as I define that peacefulness, we can be feeling many different emotions while still having that inner peace. Mm -hmm. So yes, I can act silly at times and I, and I can show my happiness and all of that with this sense of an inner peace. Yet at the same time, I can go through periods of mild depressions, of stress, of anger. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't take away an inner peace. Mm -hmm. That just means I'm human and I'm mm -hmm. reacting and responding to what's going on in my life. Mm -hmm. I think the difference is how you do that. Am I intentionally responding? Am I aware of my response? do I need to make changes? So I think that peacefulness is that peace that allows me to reflect on what I'm feeling. I'm not just going off in anger or off in depression. I can consciously go into those feelings, act that way, and then, and then begin to say to myself, is this healthy right now? Is this appropriate right now? and then make changes if necessary. Mm -hmm. So there is that intentionality, I think. Uh, so yes, I, I love uh, that approach. Uh, I, I just think we need to be real, you know, and, and then people will respond when they see you're real. Um, Cause you know, if, if you go up on stage or go on a podcast, you know, like this, and, and you, you talk about these high ideals or, or seem to be having those high ideals, Many people are going to say, I can't do that. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it separates. But when they see that you're real, I don't mm -hmm. think that takes away your ability to say, hey, I'm an expert in this or I've got information to share. Mm -hmm. I think actually people can come to you because like, wait a minute, you're, you're real. Mm -hmm. you, know, you talked about all this, but I heard you get a little stressed over there. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, wasn't that comment a little off in what you talk about? Yeah. Uh, you know, and then you can say, well, yeah, I'm human. Yeah, it, it is. But yeah. now here's what I can do about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. That awareness piece that you mentioned, the intention, intentionality and awareness. Mm -hmm. And that's also um, why I wanted and appreciated that you shared your process and your path with everybody. Because, again, it's not, it's messy. Life is messy, period. Yeah. We can try to wish it away and it's just not going to happen as far as I've seen calm, you know, I'd be happy to be called wrong on this, but I haven't experienced it. Um, what do you do for fun? Ah, for fun. Yeah. I love being out on the water, love being out mm -hmm. in nature, uh, love to read. Uh, meteorology is a hobby of mine. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, huh. Yeah, so the, there are outlets, and, and I encourage people to have outlets, um, but yeah, for me, those, those are things I've picked up over time, and uh, that, that's how I get out and have fun, and, and there are some days or some evenings that I'll say, you know what, forget the computer, forget my business stuff, I'm taking a hike, I'm going out on the water, I'm going to read a nonsense book, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I think that's that's important to have those outlets so that uh, there's some diversity in your life and you can, you know, relax. Yeah. You do that. Yeah, exactly. You know, a topic that I see coming up more and more for good reason is the one of community. Of we mm -hmm. obviously need other people. That's not a new thing. But the concept of the culture that we're in is becoming more socially disconnected despite the fact that we have more tools that supposedly keep us connected. What, what do you find personally rewarding for yourself in terms of connection? Do you have buddies you get together with or do you have an online group? What, what do you do for yourself? Well, that for me is where family comes in and um, 
I do work on the, the social media side, but honestly, I think the social media is that tool and where people lose that connection in life is because they look at the social media as the replacement for the social versus it's a tool for the social. So, you know, using the social media to get your word out, maybe using social media to meet some friends, uh, you know, getting to know some people and then maybe one day meeting them in person. Mm -hmm. um, those are great tools and, mm -hmm. and ways that we can expand that. But to be the end all, I think that's, that's where we've kind of been duped and, and we've duped ourselves into that and where people feel disconnected because they can sit back and say, but I've done all the right stuff. I'm on all of the social medias. I post all the time. I like everything, uh, but I have no friends or I feel disconnected or there's nobody there for me when I need them. Um, well, yeah, because you've done the social media as the end all. Mm -hmm. You didn't create friendships. You have friends, but you didn't create a friendship. Uh, you didn't create that community aspect. So yeah, I've found some things in town. Now this is a small town, so it's easier to meet some people, but you know, I have my outlets in, in town where, um, you know, I can just hang out and be with people, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, I think is, is very important. Um, just before this podcast, I went out to the uh, local coffee shop here in town where I've been going there for years and I know the baristas, they know me, they call me by name, I call them by name. You know, it's, it's, it is that community sense that makes a difference. And, and I would encourage people, you know, get out of yourself and find that community. And even if you live in a large city, um, you can find community in a large city oh, yeah. because, you know, when you think about it, don't you typically go to the same shops? Mm -hmm. You're probably run into the same people if you're paying attention. Mm -hmm. Even in a place like New York City, oh, yeah. you're still in the same area most of the time. You can find community if you really desire to look for it. And mm -hmm. I would encourage people to do that. You know, you mentioned friend and friendship. Do you think there's a... a degrading or a derision of the definition of friend where people really don't understand what a friend is because social media uses the term so loosely? I, I definitely do. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of terms if we wanted to make a list that, that I think we've really watered down that just don't have meaning anymore. Uh, friend is definitely one of them, I would say. You know, it's... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, talk to some of the high school students that I work with, you know, they boast, you know, thousands of friends on, on their social media. Uh, there is no way you have any type of intimacy with thousands of people. Um, you know, I look at my personal Facebook page and it, it's well under a hundred, but it's everybody that I know, mm -hmm. you, you know, so yes, I, I, I think their concept uh, and what society's concept is changing drastically. And, and that's part of the reason where I think we feel disconnected. Uh, yeah. you know, cause again, we go back to that duping ourselves, you know, that, you know, we can say, but I gained X amount of friends on social media. Why do I still feel alone? Um, you know, because how many of those people do you have a conversation with? How many of those people will be there if you need somebody? Um, that dwindles that list way down from those thousands when you start looking at that. Yeah. Um, so that's really, I think what we need to do is, is, you know, I don't care if you have thousands of, you know, Facebook friends, that's fine. But how many friends that you can go to that you can physically be with that? Yeah. Well, we need to start cultivating those as much as we're cultivating those thousands. Yeah. You know, what I think is a oddly sacrificed habit, picking up the phone and calling someone. We have, we all have phones. I mean, even young kids have phones and yet nobody uses it to make a phone call. Um, and no. that just went away through the years slowly. I mean, it just kind of disappeared. And that's an interesting thing to me because that's such a direct contact, hearing somebody's voice 
you know, connecting by voice is quite, quite special, really. Well, ex exactly. You know, using the technologies or even like the technology we're using now is way more important uh, from a connection type field uh, versus texting or, you know, posting something on uh, the social media. You do get more of that connection when you can hear somebody and you can do the fluctuations in your voice. You, you can really convey uh, a meaning by the look that you're giving. Uh, all of that is much more important for us as humans than, uh, you know, what we're doing um, you know, on the screens, you're just through text. Uh, but yeah, when you, you look at most people now, I, I don't even think we have phones with us anymore. We have computers with us Good that point. have the ability to make a phone call. Good point. It is yeah. where I think we've come down to. Yeah. Um, because yeah, people just don't, you know, I, I have in my high school office, a phone sitting on my desk, an actual phone, one of the, you know, for those who don't know what it is, Google it, but a phone. <laughs> you dinosaur. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't use it because everybody emails or texts. You know, even in, in the business side, it sits there. I, I don't pick it up. And I don't know if that's a good thing or not a good thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it just is, right? Yeah. At, at this point, it is, but I, I don't know, going back to what I'm – saying about acceptance but that next piece of the acceptance is always so what do i do about it right i don't think as a society we're reflecting on ourselves enough to say so is this a good thing or not a good thing and what do i do about it we're just yeah sitting there at this point and saying yeah that's a dinosaur that goes in the antique store get rid of it um but at what cost i agree with you i also think that when we as a culture observe something like this, the way that we can begin the change is by individually doing it. So yes. by each of us reflecting and saying, you know what, I'm gonna connect with so-and-so and taking it offline, meeting for coffee, that sort right. of thing. We begin to do that. Um, yeah, so. it, it does start individually. You know, I mean, that, that's where any movement begins. Uh, so yes, I, you know, and I, I really encourage people to start to be reflective, uh, you know, when it comes to this, I'm not anti-technology at all. I mean, I love technology. I live on my computer. You're excellent but, at it. Yeah. But it, it, it is a tool, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I, I think when we use it as a tool, I love it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't replace. And mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, we need to collectively start to reflect on that and look at what place does this technology have and where doesn't it belong so that we're not going to minimize our current technology or any advances, but put them in their proper place. Excellent. You know, if, if I have a hammer, I know what my hammer does. I know where my hammer belongs, mm -hmm. you know, so why, why don't we look at all of these technology tools in, in that same way? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, I'm going to change tracks a little bit and ask you, who influenced you? We talked about your path a little bit, Did, and it can be famous, known, unknown. Who are the big influencers in your life? There are many of them who are the unknowns. Uh, there are many people who were the unofficial mentors mm -hmm. uh, who, you know, by their example, uh, I really have begun to look at what is leadership, what is, uh, you know, living a healthy type life. Um, many of them don't even know that they were my unofficial mentors. Um, but then you have, you know, many of the people, uh, you know, out there like uh, a John Cabot's in, um, many of the people who've uh, gone before and writing about meditation. Um, when we look religiously, uh, St. Francis of Assisi was a big influence. Um, and just that simplicity of life, living in the moment, enjoying life. Um, so there were a lot of influences, uh, you know, as far as 
uh, the religious side goes. Um, but really for me, it, it's just been the people I've been working with, you know, and, and it, it might seem cliche for the counselor to say that, but mm-hmm. I've learned a lot about life through my clients. Uh, they taught me a lot, you know, and, and I, I think that has helped to shape who I am. Um, you know, I, I, in relation to many other people, my growing up in my early life was not overly difficult. Um, not overly easy, but not overly difficult. When I can gain some of the insight to what my clients have gone through, really helps me to understand what is suffering, what is resiliency, what is it like, uh, you know, to get yourself out of certain situations. How do you emotionally wrap your you know, mind around things. And, and that's a lot of what my uh, clients have been able to teach me. Um, and then from there, if you reflect on what they're teaching you, uh, then I can create a bit more empathy, um, you know, which hopefully helps to just inform my life and my work. Mm-hmm. What are, you've mentioned a couple things that I won't jump to and assume, In your words, what would you name as your top three values? Top three values. There are so many values out there. But yeah, yeah, the the top three right off the top of my head uh, would look at it as being the most important would be honesty and trust and family. you know, the, those are up there, maybe not in that order, but those are the top three. Um, you know, but, uh, also, you know, looking at that, I I would say, I don't know if it's necessarily a value, but it's, you know, can you be true to self? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and whatever that means for self, you know, Mm -hmm. again, you may not like who you are, or maybe you aren't the best person at the moment, but can you at least be true to who you are and, and, you know, be able to go from there? Uh, that's something that I would value in another person and really respect in another person. Yeah. Um, are these all topics that you talk about when you speak as a speaker? Yes. Now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So we need to wrap up soon. What's next for you? You're already doing so much and you've done so much. What is your big vision? As the type A person that I am, there's yeah. a lot of vision out there. <laughs> That's um, why I was curious to, to hear the answer <laughs> to this one. Yeah. Yeah, I think when I stop having the vision, we have a problem. Um, yeah, but seriously, the what I'm looking at is hopefully what I think are some logical progressions is uh, looking to do more speaking. And I'm working on some uh, online coursework where people can get some workbooks, worksheets, uh, and possibly, you know, just an online course where, um, you know, there would be some interaction that I can have with people and, uh, you know, kind of go from there. Something that would be more expanded from a webinar. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, just looking for more ways to get the points we've been talking about out there so that people can find their way of incorporating it and hopefully starting to spread this fact that yes we can relax we can take perspective we can find inner peace that's wonderful any is there anything that you'd like to say that i haven't asked you wonderfully thorough know that it really is possible to find inner peace whether you believe that or not it is possible and and i've seen that in a lot of people but i've seen it in myself so i'm speaking you know from the experience that this isn't just the hey the theory says uh but no I, i i did it and you know people can do it just go with it, begin to believe in it, and yes, it's possible. And once you find it, life with it is worth worth 
making the effort? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. Yep. I, I wouldn't be promoting it if, if it weren't. Yeah. I had to ask the obvious. Yeah. Oh, yes. Of, of course. I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be right sometimes. You have to, I have to <laughs> ask the obvious to be right. Um, so I'm going to have all of your information on the show notes. So people can find you on your website. They can subscribe and listen and rate your wonderful podcast. They can um, sign up for your services online because you also offer virtual coaching. Yes. But where do you hang out online? Where do you like to be on social media? Social media, the two platforms that I use the most, uh, that I enjoy the most, would be my Facebook page and my Instagram. Okay. Um, I'm on others, but those are the ones where I would interact the most. Yeah. Okay. We'll have them all listed, but I thought I'd ask, you know, in case people were mm -hmm. looking for where you were hanging out the most. So. Yes. That, that's where you'll find me, uh, moving around. <laughs> okay. And I know I track you down on Instagram, so it's fun. Yes. That's very fun. Okay. Thank you so very much. It was such a pleasure to have you on the show and I hope you'll come back sometime. Oh, definitely. I, I really enjoy talking and uh, thank you very much for having me. Talk to you soon. listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.